All right, we are recording now. Um, thank you for coming tonight, everybody. Um, I am really excited to share a little bit. Um, so for some background, my name is Megan. I think everybody here knows me, but just in case, um, I have wanted to be involved in breeding since very early on. I started riding when I was about 10, and by the time I was 12, I had said I was going to breed someday. So I have been in and out of the breeding side of the horse industry for a very long time. My first barn job when I was 15 was at a breeding facility. Um, they had Egyptian Arabs. Um, when I was just out of high school, I ended up at a farm that was being shared with a top repro vet. So on my lunch breaks and after work, I would go over and help them collecting stallions, um, ultrasounding mares, all of those sorts of things. So I've seen a lot on the vet side of it. And then, um, I have spent the last six years folding out at a couple of different facilities during the spring season. And three years ago, I bred my first horse. So oh. I'm going to talk a little bit today about the way I do things. I know that everybody does things a little bit differently, and I have a lot of respect for that. But um, I just wanted to talk to everybody about what I think is important to know before you get into breeding, because I think, especially as mare owners, it's one of those things that's very tempting to just say, oh, well, why not get into breeding? But from my perspective, it's really not something to dabble in casually um, because there are a lot of things that are complicated and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, so I'm not here to try and discourage anybody. Um, I hope it doesn't sound like that. But what I don't want to see is anybody breed casually and then get to the falling end and have something go wrong and say, oh, if only I had known that this could be this complicated. When we have access to so much information, I just think that, um, you know, it's better to be prepared. So what I want to start with tonight is why we get into breeding. Um, a lot of people, like I just said, get into it for sort of sentimental reasons. I have a mare that I really, really love and she's not rideable anymore. Um, and the, to those people, I like to say, if you are picturing yourself getting to the other end of this and having something go really, really wrong and your mare is badly injured or maybe even doesn't make it, are you going to say, I wish I had my mare back. I wish I'd never done this because if, that's going to be the case for you, then it's not worth the risk. Um, I don't know exactly what the numbers are in wild populations um, in terms of mortality rates in labor, but from what I have seen um, just in my own experience in foaling farms, the worst year I ever had, we fold out 30 mares and three mares didn't make it. So 10% of mares with attendance there with vets on site still didn't make it through that foaling season. So I think it's important for people to know that that is a possibility. Um, some people tell me they want to breed because it's cheaper. It's not. It's really, really not. Um, the only way it's cheaper is if you are looking to breed something that might be worth 50, 60, $100,000 as a three or four year old, and you don't have that cash to just lay out ahead of time. If you are breeding a 15 or $20,000 horse, by the time you have bred your mare, kept her for 18 months through breeding and weaning, um, and then fed your foal for three years before anyone can even sit on them, it's not cheaper anymore. And that's with no extra vet emergencies. That's with just really routine, easy, inexpensive board. If you are boarding somewhere where indoor is a thousand, twelve hundred dollars a month, I'm really sorry, but it is definitely not going to be cheaper to breed your own. Um, for me, I always had a really specific idea of what I wanted to breed. I always wanted to breed Irish sport horses and I think it's important to understand what your vision is for your breeding program, what your full, even if it's just one, it still needs to be a program. It still needs to be something you planned out. So for me, I am really passionate about producing Irish sport horses that are amateur friendly, that can event at the lower levels, 
that can have the brain to field hunt and be good all round horses. And then I am also really, really passionate about um, breed preservation on the Irish draft side. So for me, it's a breed I love and it's got a really limited gene pool. So they are offering what they call a grade up register where part bred mares can be inspected and be given full papers. And that's something that I'm really striving for in my breeding program to get some new blood into the Irish draft population that still follows the breed standard. So I think it's really important to know what the breed standard is or what you're looking to produce with the foal that you're creating. And that's gonna be different for every breed. I know Vicki who's joined us is bred in Icelandic. Um, Gina said she's breeding quarter horses. Kathy has a Canadian warm blood mare. So those are gonna be wildly different breed standards but I think it's still important to know what you're striving for. Sorry, I'm just gonna keep looking at my notes over here, guys, to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, the other thing that I think people forget about when they get into breeding is, are you equipped to have and raise a foal? Um, foal safe fencing is a little bit different than what we would typically look at for horses. It needs to be a little bit lower to the ground than you see a lot of the time in horse facilities. Um, are you prepared to halter break and teach a foal to lead? They're really adorable and they kick and it hurts and they're mouthy and it's, they don't come out knowing how to follow you around at the end of a rope. So that is something that I think people don't consider when they imagine a cute little baby in the barn is like, if you breed from scratch and you end up with an absolute monster of a two-year-old, that's a hundred percent on you. <laughs> um, I know I have been there. I have watched some of the foals at my own farm and, and some have tougher personalities than others. But, um, you know, I can honestly look at my three-year-old and know that anything that's wrong with her handling or her personality is a hundred percent my fault. Um, thankfully, there aren't a lot of issues, but anything that's a hole in her training right now is a hundred percent on me. Um, and then are you breeding to keep or breeding to sell? And that goes a little bit back to the sentimentality um, conversation. If you're breeding something to keep, you have a little bit more leeway in choosing your stallion, in choosing your mare. But I still really encourage people not to overlook issues in their breeding stock just because they're planning to keep it because you never know. Horses are animals that don't usually spend their entire lives with one owner. So if something happens, is this horse going to be saleable? Is it going to be something that somebody else wants? If you breed a horse that you're the only person on the planet that wants it, that means if you can't take care of it anymore, it really has no other options. And that's not why I'm in this. Does anybody have any questions before I move on to choosing your breeding stock? Um, if not, or if you have a question, just go ahead and pop it into the chat and I will see those. I am watching it. Um, choosing your breeding stock. Um, for me, with my mare, I already loved my mare. I'd already had her for a number of years. And I knew that meant that it was going to be hard to me, hard for me to be completely unbiased. I love my mare's confirmation, but she doesn't have a show career. That was never what I did with her. So it was really important to me to get a number of outside opinions that I really respected before I bred her the first time. And I'm really grateful that I have access to some really good people in the breeds that I wanted to focus on and in some really um, high-end positions in different competition industries. And they all said, yes, I, if she was mine, I would breed her too. Um, and that was really important to me just to get some outside perspective. Um, it was also really important to me that I was only going to produce registerable horses. Um, we say a lot, you don't ride the papers. The papers aren't going to mean anything in terms of what that horse might do in the competition ring. But it still means that somewhere along the line, some very experienced, hopefully impartial judges looked at your breeding stock and said, yes, we think you're going to produce quality foals here. And I think it's really important to keep checking ourselves that way 
Um, because again, like we're producing big animals, we're producing animals that are likely to have multiple homes in their lifetime. And I think it's really important to just make sure we're always focused on improving our breeds and improving the stock that's available when we make a decision to breed. When I'm choosing a stallion, personally, I like to look at my mare and look at the stallion and I pick the three faults that I most want to correct on both of those animals. And then I have to look at if I got all six of those problems, would this still be a nice enough horse? Because that can happen. Um, you can breed the best to the best and get a mediocre horse. So why breed mediocre on purpose? I just don't feel like it's worthwhile. Um, do you put more weight on the mare or the stallion? Um, temperament wise, I definitely put more weight on the mare because she's gonna be raising that foal for six or seven months. Um, a mare that's skittish or aggressive or just kind of indifferent to humans is often going to just teach her foal that that is the way they should behave around humans as well. So it was really important to me to start with mares that like me and like people. And I have now maybe a slightly too friendly three-year-old who wants to be in everybody's pocket, except she's almost 1400 pounds. Um, but definitely I, I do put a lot of stock in temperament on the stallion side. I don't like to see anybody breeding anything that is super aggressive and unhandleable. I know it happens in the thoroughbred industry and um, they are their own beast that way. Um, confirmation wise, if you have a stallion that has been breeding for a number of years, you can tend to see patterns with regards to whether he is throwing something consistently or letting the mare shine through a little bit more. Um, but in general, I focus more on the quality of the mare simply because um, the stallion can breed as many mares as the owners want to breed in a year, but it's much easier to control what you're doing with your mare. And like I said, from a temperament perspective, they're going to be the ones who, um, who are raising the baby for you. I have also, in my experience working for other really um, high-end breeders, seen all of them give 80, 85% of their credit to the mares and they're producing great horses. So um, I'm just following in the footsteps of the people who trained me uh, in that regard. Um, the stallion I bred Hope to um, has two crops of foals now on the ground, and he is really, really consistently throwing his own canter. So that's nice to see because that's not necessarily an area that Hope is really strong in. Um, but from a confirmation perspective, like I said, I, I did take a really strong look at both of them. And on my own mare, the top three things I would want to change is I like a little bit more length in her neck. I would like better feet. She's got good feet for a thoroughbred, which is still pretty mediocre for anything else. And um, a little bit of height. I like her back. She's got a good, strong, short coupled back. She's got really good legs. Um, she's got a great broad chest. So I picked the three things that I would want to change. And none of those were also faults in the stallion. If I have a short necked mare and I'm looking at a short necked stallion. And even if that is his only fault, it's pretty likely that I'm gonna get a short necked horse. So to me, if the flaw that I'm looking at in either one of them overlaps, then that's a deal breaker. And if I like one of them enough, then maybe if I like that stallion enough, maybe I will go looking for another mare that matches him better. But genetics is not a game of averages. You don't breed a short neck to a long neck and get a medium neck. You don't breed 15 hands to 17 hands to get 16 hands. And I think a lot of people think that, um, especially with height, you do get away with that sometimes, but genetically you are just as likely to get a random throwback to a grandparent or great grandparent as you are to get something directly from one of the parents. So 
I, and that is another reason that I think it's important to look at registration and licensing is because it's much easier to track those parents back three, four, five generations and see what you're likely to get. Um, so that sort of ties into what I wanted to say next, registration and licensing. Most of my familiarity is with the European warm blood breeds. So I'm going to speak to that a little bit. Um, in the warm bloods, registered and licensed are two different things. Registered means the parents were licensed, so the foal is automatically accepted into the registry, say Canadian warm blood. Licensing for a stallion means that he has passed enough tests, confirmation and ability and under saddle with enough judges that they have actually licensed him to say he's nice enough that we are going to automatically admit his offspring to our registry. If a stallion is registered but not licensed in the warm blood world, you are not guaranteed that they will accept your foal into the registry. You will have to present it on its own merits. And that can change the sale value of your baby. It also can change the quality of your baby. Maybe not. You might still get a really great foal out of an unlicensed stallion, but especially if you're brand new to breeding, why take the risk? Um, I talked a little bit already about confirmation comparison. Um, so the next thing is deciding between live cover and artificial insemination. Um, most times now in the warm blood world, at least, you won't find anybody offering live cover. There's a couple of reasons for that. It is really risky for the stallion. Um, a mare who is not quite in the mood, maybe not quite deep enough into her heat or just doesn't like your stallion, can kill a stallion. A kick to the chest can stop a stallion's heart and that's it, career's over. So most stallions now only offer artificial insemination with the exception being thoroughbreds where live cover is still the only thing that's accepted. Um, there are also some other good reasons for AI. Um, there are sexually transmitted diseases in horses. So if you are breeding to a stallion that offers live cover, even if you're not live covering your own mare, that's something to be aware of. Um, and that would be a great question for your vet is what diseases do I need to be concerned about a stallion potentially passing along to my mare? Um, live cover, usually you will end up having to ship your mare to the stallion um, unless you live close enough that you can just ultrasound her at home and ship her in day of. Um, live cover is still pretty common in quarter horses as well. That's interesting. Um, I'd be curious to know why that is when it's not required. Um, it, uh, you know, like I said, in the warm bloods, it's not something we see a lot of. Um, part of it is access. Um, breeding artificially, I can access stallions all over the world when I wouldn't spend 10 or $20,000 to ship my mare to Europe, get her bred and bring her back. I can ship over frozen semen. Um, so if we're artificially inseminating, you have a choice between what's called fresh cooled and frozen. Um, fresh cooled has the advantage of being easier, um, higher success rates with breeding and easier for the vet to do but you only have a window of anywhere from 48 to 96 hours for that mare to be bred um, from the time it's collected, depending on how well the stallion cools. With frozen, you can freeze indefinitely. People are getting successful breedings off of semen that's been frozen for 25 years, but it's a little bit more complicated for the vet and it has to be timed much more accurately. So often what you will see people do with frozen semen breedings is ship the mare to the vet and leave them there and let them take care of it. And often what the vets will end up doing is giving a series of medications to the mare to make her cycle at a specific time of day so that they can inseminate within about six hours of when she ovulates so that they can get the best possible success rate off of that frozen semen. And a lot of vets don't offer frozen AI. I know mine doesn't. They have a specialist that they refer out to. It's not something I've tried yet. Um, you also can end up paying, if you purchase frozen semen, most of the places that will store it that actually have a liquid nitrogen tank will charge a monthly rental fee to keep 
store using their tank for storage. So in this area, I've seen anywhere from 10 to $25 a month for storage. Um, again, there are some advantages. There's a stallion, an Irish draft stallion that I have looked at for years and wanted to breed to. And they just announced this spring at the end of the breeding season that he is now going to move to the UK and finish out the last couple of years of his breeding season there. But they do still have some frozen in Canada. And probably this fall, I will purchase some and store it so that I can use it on a mare in the future. Um, and I like having that option. Um, you can, oh, you have the option of breeding to stallions that are deceased. Um, I have seen people with a colt that they really like coming up who maybe needs to be gelded because uh, he's getting difficult to handle, maybe collect and freeze enough for 50 breedings as a random number and then geld him. And then you know that that is finite, but if he ends up performing well enough, you do still have the option of breeding to him. Um, as far as timing your breeding, it has a little bit to do with when your mares are cycling naturally and a little bit to do with whether it's important to you to have your full born in a specific time range. Um, naturally, mares cycle based on the amount of daylight they are getting. So if you've got a horse that's outside 24 seven in Canada, you will typically see them having strong, reliable heats from late April, early May until end of October. Um, you can modify that. You can manipulate that a little bit by doing things like bringing them in and keeping them under lights. That's how the thoroughbred industry gets them to start cycling as early as January, February, because they're looking for January born foals. And the reason you might want to time a foal like that is if you are going to be showing them in age specific classes before they're full grown. So if you're breeding a thoroughbred, uh, thoroughbred's birthday is January 1st in the Northern Hemisphere. So if your horse is born in July, when they start racing as a two-year-old, they might be six months younger than any other horse in that race. And that's a huge disadvantage at that age. In the warm blood industry, um, certainly here in Southern Ontario, we've got the Canadian uh, sport horse classes at the Royal Winter Fair. They have weanling, yearling, two-year-old, and three-year-old classes. And then the three-year-old classes are the Governor General's Cup and the Lieutenant Cup, Governor's Cup, you might want your horse to be one of the older horses in those classes because they might look a little bit more mature, they might look a little bit more filled out. If it doesn't matter to you, if those are not your goals for your horse, then I tend to prefer to breed them when they're going to be cycling naturally rather than keeping them inside under lights 16 hours a day starting in November to get them cycling for January 15th but some people do manage them that way. And that is what needs to happen is they need to have 16 hours of light on for two to three months before you expect them to start cycling. Um, cost of breeding. Um, is everybody still with me? Does anyone have any questions before I move on again? I'm gonna wait for questions while I have some water. Okay, so I talked a little bit earlier about how breeding is not cheaper than just buying something you can already see. Um, so I'm going to walk everybody through what I have spent over the last two years um, and what you can expect to spend in general. Um, when you are booking a stallion, you are looking at the stud fee, um, sometimes a booking fee. Sometimes that's included in your first year stud fee, um, which can then surprise some people. If you have to use your live full guarantee for a breed back the next year for some reason, you will usually be expected to pay the booking fee again, and that is to hold one of the contracts. A lot of stallions limit the number of contracts they are providing in a year. So your booking fee is basically a deposit. It holds that spot. Now, most stallions that I have seen include the booking fee in the stud fee. But like I said, if you're rebreeding the next year for some reason, then that booking fee is not going to be included in the second year and you do need to pay another deposit on that. Okay. Um, if you're doing AI, a collection fee is gonna be in there and that is what it's gonna cost them for their vet or AI technician or whomever is collecting the stallion to collect him, process that semen, 
extend it, chill it, put it in a box and ship it to you. Um, on the mare side, you are going to want to start ultrasounding typically a full cycle before you expect to breed your mare. So if you're looking to start breeding in April, you probably want to have your mare checked in mid to late March. Um, I pay $90 for my first ultrasound and then I want to say 65 for follow-ups. So this year it took me three ultrasounds to get the mare bred and then uh, three ultrasounds afterwards. So I'm in for six ultrasounds plus call fees, um, plus the stud fee. If your mare needs any kind of drugs to help her cycle, then that can be an added cost. I haven't had to do that, thankfully, so I don't know what those costs are. I do have a mare, though, that needs a shot of oxytocin between six and eight hours after breeding. So if that's not something you can do yourself, then you have to have somebody come back out to the farm same day to, to administer that, and that can add up as well. Um, when we're talking about cycle manipulation, um, something I really want to point out for everybody is that mares cycle on average every 21 days. I think um, as humans, we all have it in our head that 28 days is pretty normal, but in horses it is every 21 days, so every three weeks. And I believe anything from 19 to 24 is considered normal or normal range. Um, it depends on the vet you ask, but that's what mine has said to me. Um, so that is something that is important to watch because if you see your mare cycling and think, okay, well, we'll uh, try and breed her a month from now, you're gonna miss it because you really only have the three weeks. Um, costs, other costs. Um, you may need to swab your mare um, and that would be a culture and cytology. Um, that is like a super, super invasive pap smear where they actually go in and swab the uterus to make sure that there is no contaminants that's gonna prevent a pregnancy. Usually you will not do that for a maiden mare, a mare that's never been bred before, but if your vet recommends it or if your stallion contract requires it, then that is something that you need to do. I had it done last year and I want to say it was about $180 for the testing. I don't remember what it cost to actually have the vet come out and take the swab. Um, and that's another reason you want to plan ahead because that swab is going to be easier on the mare if you do it while she's cycling. So you need to do that a full cycle ahead of when you plan to breed her. Um, that is going to be especially important if you have live covered in the past or if you have a mare that has a bit of a tilted pelvis where when she is passing manure, it actually slides down um, her backside, that can contaminate the uterus with E. coli. And if that's the case, your vet is probably going to recommend a stitch called a Caslix. After she's bred, after she's confirmed in full, they will stitch her up and just leave enough of an opening for urine to pass through so that she doesn't contaminate herself after the fact and terminate that pregnancy accidentally. And then your vet has to come back out three to four weeks before she's due to full and open that back up, which I hate seeing done. I thankfully have not had to do it with any of my mares. And for me, having to do a Caslix is a deal breaker personally, but it's not for everybody. Um, I know lots of people who do it. I know, especially in the racing industry, it's very, very common to do it even with fillies who are not being bred. So something to keep an eye on as well. Um, shipping semen. Uh, this year, FedEx has been an absolute disaster. Hopefully we're not always breeding in a global pandemic, but um, cost of shipping obviously varies depending on how far you're shipping, where you are in the world, but I have seen shipping cost $80 and I've seen it cost a couple hundred dollars. It's more if you're shipping frozen because it needs to stay in a liquid nitrogen situation while it's being shipped. And often if you're shipping frozen, what the vet who's shipping it to you will do is ship an entire tank and take a deposit on the cost of that tank. And then when it arrives, you transfer it into 
the tank at whatever storage facility you're using, and then you're responsible for shipping their container back to them. That doesn't happen the same way with fresh cooled because it's usually coming in a cardboard and styrofoam insulated cooler, and then you just pay for that. I think this year they were about $45, and that would just be part of your collection fee. Everyone's still okay so far? All right. Um, once your mare has been inseminated by your vet, then it's just a waiting game for two weeks. You are going to get an ultrasound at about the 14 day mark. And that is going to be the first time you see if the mare is pregnant. Um, some people also do, um, in certain situations, you will do a check the day after you breed just to make sure the mare actually ovulated and that you don't need to order more semen and try and rebreed after 48 hours. So you may do a post-op check. I ended up doing one on my mare this year because last year she actually ended up having twins and aborting in February. And on two ultrasounds in a row, we hadn't caught the twins between myself and my vet. So this year we did a post-op check the day after we inseminated her just to make sure that she only ovulated one follicle so that we weren't second guessing ourselves through the rest of the ultrasounds. Um, Twins is bad news in horses. Um, it's adorable and we all love reading the miracle stories, but the statistic is one in 10,000 live births in horses is twins. If you have a mare that twins, 95% of the time she will abort naturally between seven and eight months, which is exactly what happened to mine. Um, and then that other 5% is a combination of one dead foal, two dead foals, and a dead mare and two dead foals. So your odds are not good. Um, it is not something to strive for. It's not something that's cute. And if at your 14 day check, it looks like there are two embryos there, um, your vet will talk to you about a procedure that we call pinching a twin, where they will selectively terminate one of those two pregnancies and hope the mare carries on with the second one. Um, and part of the reason we check at 14 days is because you only have until the 17th or 18th day to pinch a twin before it becomes um, too risky to the other pregnancy. And then you're better off just terminating the whole pregnancy and starting fresh. The next ultrasound that you're going to have is at roughly 28 to 30 days. And that is going to be your heartbeat check. That is where... Um, if the twins are touching and one can't be pinched, what's your personal action plan? My vet's action plan, if the twins are too close together, is to keep rechecking them every 8 to 12 hours until we get a shot. Because at the 14-day mark, they are still bouncing around, moving around the uterus. They haven't attached yet. Um, if you hear people in the industry using the term settled, um, you know, I'm not going to ship my mare anywhere until she's settled. That is the point where the pregnancy has actually attached to the uterus and started to grow placenta. And that happens around the 35 day mark. So if the twins are too close together and the vet says that they can't pinch one, my vet has said the action plan there would be we have about three days to just keep checking and see if they're far enough apart. Otherwise, personally, I would lutealize, which is a drug to terminate that pregnancy and then start fresh on the next cycle. Um, especially seeing what I went through with my mare this year, um, going back to cost, um, having her abort cost about $2,000 in vet fees just to have my mare come through it okay and have no foals to show for it this spring. So over and above my stud fee, my AI fees, um, all the vet work, and then paying board on that mare for eight months, I then spent another $2,000 for her just to get her through that illness. We thought that she had something called placentitis when we started treating her. And then when she actually went into labor and aborted those twins, um, it was pretty awful. And she ended up on antibiotics for three weeks. She ended up on banamine and regumate and a bunch of other drugs. Um, and 
yeah, like I said, it was about $2,000 just to have nothing show for it. So I absolutely would not try and do that again, both from a fiscal perspective, but also because if she went to term, odds are that I would lose her or one of, or both of the foals anyway. And foals that are twins are almost always, always as far as I know, stunted. So you're never going to get a horse the size that you expected. Um, and the reason for that is that foals develop very, very differently than human babies. Um, by the time a mare is at term going into labor, the placenta that that foal has grown covers basically the entire surface of the uterus. So the reason that twins tend to abort naturally around the eight month mark is because that is when those two individual placentas have covered enough of the surface area that they can't grow anymore and that they are at the point, as far as the mare's body is concerned, where a full grown single foal would be ready to go. Um, so if they make it to term, they will both have had compromised blood supply for at least the last two to three months of that pregnancy. Um, so they will usually be stunted. They will usually need help standing and nursing for days and days. Um, and I bottle fed a baby this year for nine days that never managed to stand before she passed. And it is exhausting and gut wrenching. Uh, it's not something I would recommend anybody goes through, but it is another thing that can happen. Um, so 30 days, then you get your heartbeat check. Um, 30 days is typically where I go back to riding if I have stopped riding the mare. And that is a back and forth that a lot of people have. Um, I mentioned, we say the pregnancy has settled. The reason you're looking for the pregnancy to settle before you do anything too extreme is because until that pregnancy has actually physically attached to the mare, she is vulnerable to losing it if she gets a fever or anything that elevates her body temperature or stresses her out too much. So that is really a matter of knowing your mare. Um, and just like in humans where they say, you can keep doing what you were doing, but don't try and add anything new. The advice from veterinarians is almost always the same. Keep doing what you were doing with your mare, but don't change anything. Don't add anything to extreme. Um, so for the first 30 days of pregnancy with my mare personally, we kept trail riding, um, but we didn't travel anywhere. We didn't do anything high stress. We didn't do any ring work because she doesn't like that. Um, it's also a time when I tend to be much more militant about quarantine because like I said, um, even if your mare's fully vaccinated, the, a slight fever can make her body just go, I need to protect myself, um, get out of here. And um, I'm a little bit concerned at the moment about my mare. She should be at about 75 days, but we did have a new horse come onto the property while she was at about the 35 day mark. So I am having my vet out this week just for one extra check, just to make sure. Um, I have in the past only done a 14 and a 30 day check. Um, I know in the racehorse industry, it's really common to also do 60, 90, and some people even do a 120 as well. Um, some people do 30, 45, and 60. Um, after the 35 day mark, if your horse loses that pregnancy, odds are she will not come back into heat that season. So to me, doing a check beyond the 30 days, the first two times wasn't important to me because if she lost that pregnancy, there was no way we were going to be able to breed her back. And it wasn't important for me to know I was confident we'd gotten a heartbeat, it was good. And I was happy with that. Now I'm gonna have an extra ultrasound this year just because I'm a little bit concerned and I need to settle my own nerves and not wonder until next May. That's really what it boils down to. Some people do a 60 and 90 day check just to see if they can find out the sex of the foal. Um, that is something that has become more common. It's not something my vet does personally. I think it's a lot more common in the States. Um, I've never bothered because again, I, you know, an ultrasound costs me about $90 plus having the vet on the farm. Plus with my mare, she needs to be sedated for her ultrasound so that she behaves herself and doesn't try to kill my vet. And then we still get a 50-50 shot 
of finding out the answer of something that's a 50-50 anyway. So to me, it is absolutely not worthwhile. But if you were breeding a very high-end foal and, for example, you're going to sell in utero and you have a client that maybe only wants the colt option or only wants the filly option, that is something that does happen in the industry, at least in the warm bloods. And maybe it's worthwhile for you to get that answer. So that is something that you can choose to do if your vet is up for it. Um, and then after that point, it's really a waiting game. Um, there are definitely some things you need to change throughout the pregnancy for the mare in terms of when to increase feed. Um, she will need some extra vaccinations and things like that. But I really think that pregnancy care for a brood mare is its own topic. So I'd rather do um, a separate day for that later on in the fall rather than trying to cram it all in in the next couple of minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, you guys are welcome to unmute yourselves if you'd like. We can just chat. There's only a few of us here. How long into the pregnancy can you continue to ride? Um, lots of people say five to six months. Um, for me, it has been basically until her girth doesn't fit anymore or until she gets cranky and tells me to stop. Um, I don't tend to ride a ton in the winter anyway. So both of the years that Hope has been pregnant, I have ridden her. We bred in May. I rode her right up until late October and then stopped. Um, I have a friend whose mare got uncomfortable enough that she started fussing and rooting and bucking at her saddle. So she, that was when she decided to stop. Um, in general, though, um, six months is fairly safe. Um, and then through the winter, when she starts to get fluffy and fat all at the same time, it just becomes not worth it anymore. <laughs> I think it also probably depends on what you're doing as well, Kathy. Um, again, uh, my mare is really just my trail horse extraordinaire at this point. If I was still using her in lessons and jumping around three feet a couple days a week, I would start to back that off a little bit sooner, but I would probably continue to trail ride up until the middle of the winter um, because the exercise is good for them. And that um, pelvis tilt that I talked about a little bit earlier that can result in the mares contaminating themselves is something that you can combat to an extent by keeping their core really, really strong, which is the reason I do continue to ride my brood mares in the first place um, is because in every species that I'm aware of, abs help. Abs just help uh, you carry your pregnancy better. Um, and the same is true for horses. I understand that huge breeding farms don't have time to continue to breed or breed to uh, ride or exercise every brood mare all the time. And that is what it is. Um, but I have only one brood mare this year and two next year to breed. So that is something that. Uh, that I do. After that, should you have an exercise program like lunging? I probably wouldn't. Um, I'm not a huge fan of lunging for exercise anyway. Um, I think it depends on the mare. Um, I tend to prefer doing more uh, carrot stretches and things like that to keep their back strong. Um, maybe a lot of like I would pony off another horse if I have one that will do that. Um, mine are turned out 24 seven on a really hilly property. So I'm not really concerned about fitness in my mares at the moment. Um, but in general, I probably wouldn't do anything later on in the pregnancy that's gonna make her uncomfortable or sour. It's just, I haven't found that it's worthwhile. Sorry, guys. Oh. 
well. It looks like that might be it for questions. Um, I'm really, really glad everybody came tonight. Uh, this is something I'm really passionate about and I am planning to do a couple more of these through the fall and winter. Uh, my plan right now is to put the recording up on my YouTube channel, but I have also started a Patreon page. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with Patreon, it is more of a subscription style service. Um, and I have started blogging a little bit about what I've been going through with my own horses this year. And I think moving forward, I will probably move to hosting the live events over on Patreon for subscribers and then posting the replays for free. Um, so if you guys feel like checking that out, um, I can put a link in the Facebook event after the fact. Um, it's just Chiron Equine on Patreon. And right now my subscription level is set at $3 a month uh, because it's brand new. And I would love to build a community of people who want to chat about breeding and uh, what we're doing with our mares and what that process looks like for everybody. And then if people want me to add other tiers for one-on-one -on -one access or for live Q and A's and things like that, then I will maybe build it out from there. So thank you, Kathy. Um, I will post the link in the Facebook event when we're done here. Um, so far I've got three articles. I will definitely post the link for this replay there as well. Um, and then, like I said, through the fall, I want to talk again about broodmare care. And then probably in January sometime before we actually get deep into foaling season, I will do another one about preparing for foaling, um, what to look for. Um, I'm in the middle of editing a big long video about what's in my foaling kit at the moment um, for the YouTube channel. So that will go up as well um, pretty shortly if I can make myself finish editing. Um, Love to see one about broodmare care. Okay, that's awesome. Um, and if you guys have any other topic suggestions, I would love to keep doing this. Um, like I said, I think it's a part of the horse industry that sort of mystifies people. And I am really excited to be able to share. So thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate your time tonight. I am glad to have you here and I will see you again soon.